Thanks very much for inviting me. Matt, Matt's given me the challenge of, of horizon scanning. Uh, where do, do I, as someone straddling clinical medicine, public health, the informatics challenges, and the statistical requirements for turning more of those data into insights that are actionable, where, where do I see the bottlenecks at the moment in statistical methodology? So what is this fulcrum between maximizing the utility or usefulness of the data and properly measuring uncertainty. So I'd like to go back to a few origins. We call the Farr Institute eponymously after William Farr, as it's our first instance that we could find in history of computational health data approaches. His drinking buddy was actually Charles Babbage. So the long division for the 1841 census for the life tables was done via FAR's commissioning of a difference engine, a difference engine that actually had to be built with precision engineering from Sweden, but it was deployed here. The hundred years before that, we'd had the doctrine of chances published by de Moivre, and then this interplay that begins with medicine. So we have a big argument starting between Laplace and Louis pushing back on some of the safety and effectiveness of medical interventions. You have you know, BMI and Ketelet rebuked for heresy over the average man. This great pushback of statistics of medicine, but almost industrializing some of the uses of the administrative data and public health. And we start to rise uh, in our requirements for disciplined statistical approaches through evidence-based medicine, so building a scientific basis. Joseph Lister there, the Colt Wallach spray, uh, experiments that had irrefutable evidence that were backed up with statistical approaches, pushing through the early 1900s with the statistical movement from Francis Golden, Carl Pearson there, over to the end of George under Yule, through to an experimental philosophy of Ronald Aimler Fisher and colleagues, industrializing this supply chain of evidence into needy areas of decision-making in medicine. But then we have the deployment of that evidence into practice, which takes another 30 years. From Archie Cochran, there, the itinerant preacher of evidence, effectiveness and efficiency, and standing that up in this country, through to a global movement of evidence-based care. As Dave Sackett, I had the pleasure of doing my student elective with her in the 80s. But what have we got now? Okay, we have islands of evidence. We have a disjoint in a much of our evidence base. Take Zach here as a model patient, 47-year-old guy with asthma since early childhood, schizophrenia since teenage, and he's an overweight smoker. Zach is served by three channels and three supply chains of evidence here. From psychiatry, who are interested in his antipsychotic medication adherence, fed by guidelines, fed by an evidence base that is around mental health research. The medication adherence actually puts up his weight. Putting up his weight gives him more problems with his medication adherence and symptoms in, with asthma. The steroids he takes for his asthma affects his mood, which reciprocally then gives him further problems with his mental health. But the respiratory team are fed by another supply chain of evidence. And his primary care team are trying to take an overview. They have a relatively sparse evidence base, particularly around multimorbidity. But Zach is not the sum of those different models. He's the union, a complex union. We don't have a statistical framework for deploying a union of those models into care at the moment. Yet we're pushing headlong into precision medicine. So let's take an example through asthma here in precision medicine approaches. So we've got a condition that's remitting and relapsing, usually over a lifetime. It's complex. 50 to 60% hereditability, but less than 2% of the phenotype variations actually explained by current studies. Here we have one particular factor, the CD14 endotoxin receptor. So the hygiene hypothesis of let your children play in muck, they won't develop allergies and asthma. But studies around the world had different effects or no associations. So CLL associated, TLL associated. Eventually, 
it was resolved by relating the dose of endotoxin to the response on these genetic polymorphisms, opposite responses, averaging out. So can we look deeper and learn more just from that variation of simple clinical data that we have that are coming through the informatics uh, avenues at the moment? Here we have Danielle Belgrave's analysis of data from 1,000 children here in Manchester. Uh, latent class analysis, well-reasoned model, where you see this subgroup here of persistent troublesome wheeze arise through the life course as the children are growing up, they get more and more wheeze symptoms. The wheeze symptoms are reported by clinicians and by parents and jointly modeled. There's a persistent controlled wheeze group and there's a transient early wheeze group here. You see the effects are quite different for subsequent exacerbations and hospitalizations. This persistent troublesome wheeze group, very much higher likelihood of unscheduled care. But those groups we can overlay to biological factors. Here looking at specific airways resistance, so how much resistance as the child's growing up, the lungs are developing. Again, the persistent troublesome wheeze class showing a much higher resistance in these children growing up. And you see further sensitization relationships, so allergies and asthma related, again, this class showing a higher level of sensitization. Now look over time, we'll take an approach, a similar approach, a longitudinal latent class modeling approach. But here, trying to address the received wisdom that there is a progression of allergies through different end organs. So first of all, hitting the skin, atopic dermatitis, then hitting the lungs with asthma, then through to the nasal mucosa with allergic rhinitis. This was published in policy for asthma and allergies, saying if you've got children with eczema, look for asthma in those children as normal clinical practice. But it was based on aggregate studies. Just here, life course population level data, a peak of dermatitis, a peak of asthma, and a peak of allergic rhinitis, so-called allergic march, with a lot of post hoc rationalization about the biology that might explain that, and studies spawned because of that. Yet the data existed for individual level longitudinal studies. So here we overlay, we're, we're, we're using a, a graphical model approach here uh, to really look at more of the joint probability distributions that might be over averaged in regression approaches uh, to allow transition between different sensitization end organs, whether that's nasal mucosa, lungs, or skin, at measurements aged 1, 3, 5, 8, and 11. So a prior structure around which we are going to use machine learning algorithms to expose the metastructure in the data to generate further hypotheses. And it was very clear that this group that was supposed to be the predominant clinical driver, the allergic march, look for those children who've got eczema to develop asthma, fewer than 5% of the population when we used individual level data showed that pattern of progression. An ecologic fallacy that was pushed aside correctly, but it took a long time and the data existed long before that. Then we need to consider the collection of those data in a world of connected devices becoming more frequent. Biology and environment interact frequently. And we can reason that their effects are cumulative. So much of our evidence is from studies that measure points in the life course infrequently but deeply. They have their place. Yet we have a disease risk environment that may have patterns for one particular endotype, an underlying biological type that varies very quickly. A treatment environment that has a different temporal pattern of exposures through to treatments that is quite different and needs characterizing. Behind the scenes, we have an evidence base that may focus on parts of the underlying mechanisms. So we're looking at an incomplete picture to 
of prior information for pre-structuring those models. So looking at the data is a bit like looking through a prism, through a doily at the problem. Yet there are these large classes from the high-level organization data, the clinical data, that we need to consider very carefully in their interaction with environment. So the ubiquitous data, given. There are many people in this room will be wearing triaxial accelerometers that are automatically uploaded or stand on weighing scales that automatically upload their data. Through to then influencing your behavior and your experience of symptoms and maybe your medication behaviors. If the clinic visit is here and here, and this is one endotype with slow fluctuation, and this is an another endotype with fast fluctuation, this is totally invisible to the clinic. Now, these data are essential to precision medicine. My health data ecosystem looks a little bit like this. Where's the predictive information versus the information that might be used in research studies? Well, the NHS knows quite a lot about my miserable June, my seasonal allergies and my hay fever, occasionally with asthma. And yet I'm generating quite a lot of data here in my public transport choices. My aim to increase physical activity levels to offset maybe some genetic risks of developing early heart disease. A lot of N of 1 experimentation happening here, a fair bit happening here. Very difficult to capture in current studies, but the data exist. That brings me to the point of place of reusing the information we have about those covariance structures that really shrink in ways that we don't fully understand into place. Here's a map of the tram system here in Manchester, courtesy of Kingsley Purdom, with expectation of life at birth from 66 for a man here in Rochdale over to 79 in East Didsbury here. Massive variation, like a piece of chromatography paper when we think about those environmental and social determinants of health. Yet, we have this kind of picture where the US is pouring an awful lot of money into health and care systems and a lot of consumer health at the moment. And this is the return on investment, 1970 to 2014, yeah. pouring more and more in, but this is life expectancy on the vertical axis. Most countries clustered around this relation. So the answer here is to look very closely at place in ways that we are not doing in big picture at the moment. Therefore, the Connected Health Cities program, which will be launched this week, is going ahead across north of England, where many different sources of data, from health and social care through to environmental data, from and pollution monitors on lampposts here, to your public transport uses, will be put together with groups of statisticians in places of trust. And there'll be a simple starting point of looking at the flows of patients across multiple services and comparing their observed and expected outcomes. It's a start. The most important thing is the conversation with the public about these potentially disclosive data. A local bylaw has been passed in Manchester of a duty to share data where it is in the public interest to do so. And if you look on the Twitter hashtag data saves lives feed, you will see a big conversation. A big conversation that has patients saying, Please mobilize these data. If there's a safety signal about prescribing in the pr primary care data and they're not being used, send them to the statisticians and make those data work for the community. So this is our response, to make those data work cross boundaries more. But plugging in research here, a Medical Research Council funded project, really trying to shrink the... Uh, the cross-sectional view that is usually constrained by paper technology in psychometrics to a mobile phone app for patients with schizophrenia to monitor their symptoms, feel more in control, and relate those symptom changes to medication behaviors. Instead of asking 20 questions at one point in time, the positive and negative symptom score here asked at different points in the day. First, you have to teach a machine, you have to develop algorithms that infer when you might be annoying someone so that they're not going to answer frequently. Then you have to optimize the information under that curve of observation that has got the right timing 
to give you that balance of utility and minimum uncertainty. This is actually being plugged now into clinical workflows. So the community psychiatric nurses, instead of a best guess six weekly visit to patients in their homes, are getting signals from uh, these apps and developing a proportionate response of the service. So we need actionable analytics, but behind the scenes, there are a number of statistical problems that don't finish at the end of the research project. Here's an example of work that's several different projects combined to build from the previous project, draining the primary care data into a place of trust, a trusted research environment, where statisticians and software engineers can work together here uh, in my lab, having this sort of usual information that GPs would expect, so 45 patients exceeding these particular targets, but the next logical step to action the information is click to identify the patient. This is about blood pressure control and targets in high-risk patients. There's the blood pressure over time in the individual patient. There's prescription changes. So really getting into that conversation of care and the patients involved in, in our research say, can we see that information at the same time? If there's a change, can we receive a text message to be notified? Then the companies are saying, decision support, we're worried about the liabilities. And typically, academia will produce papers every 10 years on a particular clinical predictive model. It's a, an extreme example of the Euroscore model. In red is the expected, in black is the observed. What's uh, the outcome is death within 30 days of coronary artery bypass grafting or stenting. Euroscore model used throughout Europe, fitted in the late 90s, drifted so much in calibration by the early 2010s that it was not fit for purpose, over-predicting by more than twice. But a typical calibration drift, at the same time as regulators are saying, algorithms should be treated as medical devices. How do we have that new model between academia, industry, and this kind of statistical surveillance? And then, the information actionability needs to be measured. Increasingly, human-computer interaction research, here eye tracking. So these are longitudinal patient results, these are test results. You're showing them to patients, seeing where do their eyes rest, in red is more. You show them to clinicians, does a clinician look at a chart differently to a patient? Quite a few inference problems here, systems that we want to up and down weight particular detail in the data to maximize the communication of the information. So, there are many statistical challenges. I've just given you a few. I mean, to summarize, minimizing uncertainty and maximizing utility in a union, that reductionist, careful, parsimonious mindset of the statistician, alongside the constructionist engineering mindset of people building these systems, working together our experience is extremely good. There are many challenges I see unmet. Adaptive sampling, that app interaction. How do we know when to adapt according to a model that's giving an inference here to a sampling process here that needs to optimize to this utility over here. It's obvious in certain technologies, battery life and motion sensing and analytic, etc. Routine randomization. If we launch relative risk reductions at the end of clinical trials into the real world, what is that framework of statistical surveillance? To have an honest conversation with the patient of when you've reached that echo point, I don't know what's best for you. Would you like to offer yourself a routine randomization? Heterogeneous scaling. One of the greatest weaknesses, as you will well know, in much observational research in epidemiology, in clinical epidemiology, is failure to exploit the rich diversity of populations and settings, structures and populations, environments, etc. There's some nice papers, I like Sam Thompson's paper, looking at several hundred different observational studies, pretty much of the same effect, showing that if you instrumented the heterogeneity of the environments from which those studies arose, you would converge upon a more accurate answer in a more timely way. Can we synchronize, can we choreograph our statistical activities across data where we're increasingly connected in that way? The FAR Institute is committed to doing that. Assisted reasoning. I showed you examples of exposing structure in data alongside 
following causal hypotheses about the structure in the data in the asthma research. But what is that heuristic? Have we defined that framework for blending the machine learning um, and modeling in those ways? Dynamic modeling. The cumulative data, when many of the underlying factors are hard to measure, if we could measure them well, they might be in scope. So some models will drift in calibration to the point where they can be recalibrated by cumulative data. Others will reach a boundary point in an emergent system where other factors need to be brought into that model and its structure rethought. That has to be systematized. Observation processes are increasingly instrumented by technologies and people are related to their, and their behavior over data through those technologies. Can we use those instruments to better understand observation processes? Temporal complexity, enormous in a world of more frequently observed health and behavior in place. Those multi-level problems overlain onto disease processes where the biology is increasingly telling us there are points of no return, cumulative damage. I say 20% of people you know, after stroke will develop a point of no return in dementia. There's a brain inflammation that will just fall off a cliff. Can we really understand the data at different levels of organization to know when we're nearing those tipping points, to understand the subgroups of disease that are more susceptible to those fast tipping points? And practical areas such as statistical disclosure risk and proportionate approaches to privacy. I'll conclude by just posing a, posing a challenge for you. As many large companies are putting a lot of money into building models to health avatars, representations of your health and well-being information that will create an N of one signal about your health journey and its interaction with the environment. At some point, some of those health avatars might say no to healthcare providers' care pathways, and there will be a big statistical debacle at that point. We need better to understand the biology behavior and environment interaction, not just the biology environment interaction. I think there's a vast statistical frontier there of temporal complexity and dynamic effects. There's a tsunami of data, there's a blizzard of different things people do with the data, often badly, and there's a relative drought of very precious expertise, which is the people in this room. My plea is to Measure that uncertainty with that scarce and important expertise hand in hand with those trying to build scale into health informatics. Thank you for listening. I'm Margaret James and I work in public health intelligence. And I'm slightly concerned that, um, I, 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 very interesting lecture, um, many, many, many challenges. Um, and I've often thought of many of the challenges you've, you've represented. How I want to really know, we have started to build an infrastructure within the NHS of public health intelligence where we can use the data more intelligently to use it for prediction and use it to predict um, patients' health and putting together um, better, better intelligence for better treatment, in fact, on the population. How is, you, you mentioned that you're launching this new project for... Connected Health Cities. Yes, Connected Health Cities. How can that link with already, the already existing public health intelligence network so that we make maximum use of the statisticians in public health intelligence as well as in academia? Thank you, Margaret. It, it's a very important point. How, how do we actually connect people who are reasoning and making inferences as a network? How do you have assisted reasoning where there may be parts of a model that are understood in one area of expertise and others uh, in another. It can be regional, it can be discipline based, it can be organizational based. But currently there is huge waste of relearning, even down to basic data processing. So that a lot of time and precious expertise in this room may be wasted on uh, problems that should be open to machine to machine communication and automated processing. 
Further, there are vast resources going into statistical uh, support of information-seeking behaviors and inferring what parts of an inference might be relevant from one group to another. So building that scale could borrow from an awful lot of what industry is building semantic web technologies, for example. We've published a lot about the infrastructures, the Big Data Technology Initiative in the United States. It's important, the basic research object, eLab thinking. That's a well-tried and tested, peer-reviewed route to creating the right infrastructure. A technology is the easy bit. The culture is a harder bit. Getting people to work in new ways across the data in ways that are quite disruptive um, to current intelligence activities. Okay, so I think in the interest of time, better leave it there. So let's thank um, Ian Buchan again. watch, you know, like the solution to everything nowadays. Um, so smartphones have become more and more ubiquitous. It's 85% of the general population now owns a smartphone, and therefore you can access, well, have potential access to a lot of information that's generated every day, every minute. Same is true for the smartwatches or pedometers or anything that's related to fitness trackers. Approximately 40% of the general population has one, and that trend is rising as well. And this really opens up new possibilities in the field of mental health. Patients could have a greater insight in tracking their own disease, but also it would allow clinicians to track them a lot better and then have dynamic intervention processes. So, apologies. So let's just, um, let's just um, recap a little bit. Um, Professor Meng already talked to us about big data today, but really at the moment we are looking at the high resolution, high resolution data. And by Gartner, big data is defined by the three Vs, so velocity, volume, and variety. However, in the field of mental health, we are not as sort of fast paced, so we're still working with high volume data, but that only comes in, in a sort of periodic uh, manner. And there we have to sort of face the challenge of trying to find the complex relationships within all the noise that we're gathering. And so the, the um, main challenge at the moment is this translational gap between the rise of wellness apps and the rise of having these possibilities or these hardware devices and trying to implement them in a clinical system. Um, especially for um, mental health, it is particularly difficult to transfer this raw resolution data into something that can be quantified in a behavioral sense. And as a result, many studies have been limited to using active sensing, so that means patients having to enter actively into their smartphone and answering questionnaires, or passive, passive sensing, which means as if um, having access to sensors on the smartphone, but then only making comparisons between control and patient groups. And really, what this then means is that we had had a, a short success in these active sensing um, studies. However, um, particularly when you implement them in a, in a clinical system, the burden to the, to the patient is a lot higher when they have to get out their phone and answer them every time. So the idea is that you, once you have built a uh, passive sensing system, that patients would do a lot better. And therefore, we have to bridge this translational gap. And the way we were trying to do this is by using detection of intra-individual changes in real time and trying to associate these with the mental state. On top of that, the patient engagement and clinical or clinician as, uh, engagement aspect is very important. So how do we design an IT system that's capable of generating a lot of high resolution data while keeping the patient and the clinician engaged? Um, so Excuse me. Sorry. So I'd like to talk to you about um, SleepSight. That's one of our studies where we try to investigate using or inferring from intra-individual changes of patients, uh, schizophrenia patients, to associate these with the mental state. 
I'm just going to stay sitting right here. So schizophrenia is a, is a complex mental illness. It's ca characterized by having a positive and negative symptoms. Um, these, con these include hallucinations and abnormal behavior, and it's actually one of the 10 leading uh, diseases or disability of disability worldwide. Additionally, it, there is a very high cost associated with this to the NHS, approximately 3.9 billion annually. And therefore, there is a lot of interest in trying to uh, have sort of dynamic interventions and uh, for these patients. Now, luckily, um, the relapse within schizophrenia, or psychotic relapses, they don't just happen all of a sudden. There are early signs or subtle symptoms which manifest themselves two to three weeks prior to the actual relapse. And this can be quite variable within patients. This can, can be anxiety, dysphoria, or even poor concentration. However, one very, very sort of um, consistent um, symptom is insomnia. And that is measurable using these um, connected devices. And this is just a, a small illustration of what we were trying to do. So when you have the uh, symptom severity increasing, it is now possible using sleep and motor activity as well as heart rate to try and find this prodromal uh, relapse uh, time window and ideally intervene before the relapse occurs. And in order to do this, we um, collaborated with the uh, CBITS, Center for Behavioral Intervention Technologies at Northwestern University, which developed an app called Purple Robot. And that allows you to access any kind of data generated on your smartphone and stream it to any date or any server that you'd like. So that means we have access to location services, the messages that you send, email, Facebook, Instagram, everything. But of course, we didn't, you know, there are ethical uh, implications with this, and therefore we actually just limited it to um, a general behavior of the phone. So when does the patient use the phone and the accelerometer data? On top of that, we used a wearable device. Uh, when we started this, um, this study, that was back in 2014, and the Fitbit Charge HR came out. It was particularly new and had a optical heart rate sensor on board, which made it very attractive to us, in addition to its uh, Bluetooth capabilities. So what you can see here is the Gene Active Watch, and it's just an example of clinically validated devices, which are more accurate, but at the moment, or at the time, didn't have any kind of real-time streaming capabilities. So that's why we uh, chose this commercial consumer device. And in order to um, create a gold standard, so basically compare the mental state based on a clinically validated um, questionnaire, we also designed a, um, a little app where the patient could enter sleep and wake times, and then also answer um, a clinically validated questionnaire, ClinTouch, which also Dr. Professor Vukan um, showed to us today. So all in all, this allowed us to build a system which would um, be able to collect real-time data and then have event-driven feedback to the clinician is secure and device agnostic. This is particularly important when you want to design a system that's capable of being used for, for several years where um, technology moves on and you would, would like to switch out the device that you're using. So this is just some metadata. We had 15 patients and our acceptability criteria was 70% of wear time, which is the red bar. And you can see that actually all of the patients um, had a, a much higher percentage of wear time across 56 days of study period. And then the blue and the uh, green bar are sleep questionnaire and symptom questionnaire data. And you can see that in some patients that wasn't as hi um, in, uh, highly submitted as, as we would have liked. However, that it's enough to actually generate um, some quite nice gold standards for the passive data that we gathered. So this is some high-resolution re high data. I hope that you can see this. Every column is a day, and every row is a minute. And in this particular instance, it's heart rate that's being depicted, color-coded by the uh, beats per minute. Red is high beats per minute, blue is, is low beats per minute. And you can see that during the night, the heart rate actually consistently is lower compared to highly, highly variable heart rates during the day. And what this shows is that this particular patient has a very regulated lifestyle. The patient goes to bed at some point in time and wakes up approximately at the same time throughout the entire study period. This is 
an opposite example. So what you can see here, it's a little bit hard to see, it's a free running circadian cycle. So in this particular instance, the patient didn't have any sort of adherence to a daily lifestyle uh, or daily rhythm, which is exactly what we would like to catch before a relapse event happens. Now, there are multiple ways of trying to identify these, and the traditional way was using feature extraction, so trying to take a lot of data and then reduce it into a few numbers. And now machine learning has become more popular, particularly in the classification and regression uh, analyses. However, what we wanted to have a look at, what I would like to um, show you, you're probably familiar with these, Gaussian processes to identify anomalies within behavior. So for those who are not familiar with these, um, a general um, machine learning um, sort of function normally is you have some complex data, you put it into a function, and that maps to some target, which is supervised learning. However, in the Gaussian process, you actually don't ask, can we map this to a target, but also what is the expected likelihood of getting, getting that. And the way we did this, this is the, the same heart rate that you, uh, that you saw before of the patient that has a regular daily is rhythm, and that is the submitted symptom questionnaire um, score. And then from, from the score, we set a threshold which allowed us to identify the patient's best days, and then everything else was put into a sample data set. And from that, we were able to model a 24-hour period of time versus heart rate. So this is, again, sort of night time where the patient is asleep, and then during the day, the heart rate variability is a lot higher. Um, then that's, that's sort of the, the twofold Gaussian process model where we then ask, well, what's the, what's the um, standard deviation that's expected once we have a certain amount of heart rate? And you can see that this actually clusters into um, two particular clusters in this case, which allows us to then model the expected uh, variance across, across a day. And then we can ask the following question, well, how well does a particular day um, of, uh, or heart rate day uh, model or fit the model? And we can quantify the residual error in this particular case, the deviance, deviation from, from our model and assign a certain error to it. And the nice thing about this, or the most important thing, that we can do this in real time. So what you can see here is the patient that's smoothed out heart rate curve that's sort of going across the day and then here you can see the error being dynamically calculated. In this case, the patient adheres to the model reasonably well, so the, um, the model actually doesn't cross the threshold which was set here. In other cases, so in this case, um, the, the, the patient experiences a day where the patient is actually falling asleep uh, during the day and then uh, also has an extended um, sleep where the model then uh, detects anomaly. anomaly. Um, this is not necessarily a, a diagnostic uh, way of identifying relapses or early, early signals. It's more that this is the first step to ident identifying a change in behavior. So a succession of these over multiple days would probably um, or have likely think, be likely to be uh, associated with relapse in schizophrenia. So this was the first challenge um, sort of trying to find intra-individual changes in behavior. And then the next um, study that we just started uh, at the at King's College London across multiple institutions was um, is the RADAR CNS project, which is remote uh, assessment um, of um, multiple disease types in this case. Sorry. Um, multiple, multiple disease types, epilepsy, depression, and multiple sclerosis in a lot larger patient group, which is 1,500 patients. And there, really, we're trying to address the second challenge. How do we design an IT system that's capable of dealing with a lot of velocity and variety of data and um, keeping the patient and the uh, uh, clinician engaged? So just in summary, um, the Sleep Side project uh, we were able to detect inter-individual changes in real time, and then that's still ongoing, trying to validate this association with the mental state. And then the second challenge, that's what we're trying to address now in the radar project, 
is can we design an IT system that's, that fits all the stakeholders, so clinicians, researchers, uh, patients, and then the healthcare system. Thank you very much. Uh, right. So for joining psychologists. Um, terribly interesting. I, I don't know whether I missed it within, but at this time, obviously you're hoping that the data can go to what clinicians and able to support and offer effective treatment for patients. Will the patients also be getting that real-time feedback, uh, especially within that visual manner, so they can also have that option of controlling their own um, or monitoring their own progress and having that element of control, which is often quite missing in person, especially within schizophrenia. Yeah, I think that's. I think it's really important for for the patients to see how they're progressing. In the sleep site uh, study, we didn't do that on purpose, just so we would know whether the patients would actually adhere or whether they would actually comply with using the device without being influenced by the feedback which worked really well, which we were really happy about. But in the next step, the, the feedback is, would, be sort of, would be implemented and very important to, for, the, for the patients as well. How would that be? That, would that be the immediate feedback? Would they be able to There would be immediate feedback, 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 exactly. Yeah. Thanks for coming and staying. Uh, so I think I'll step back and talk more about uh, more traditional statistics, uh, interesting as those two presentations were. Uh, so I, I will mainly talk about my experiences in using these large databases, and there's quite a lot of interest in them from uh, statisticians, from uh, um, uh, policy-making bodies, let's say, uh, from clinicians. Uh, let's see what they can do and what they can't, basically. So this is an outline of the talk, so I'll give you some examples. Um, um, some critique of the methods, of the messages we can take from this analysis. Um, some tools that have been developed and are being developed. So it's a very fast moving field. Um, and a summary. So um, the background, electronic health records. Let's start with the basics. So uh, what does it mean? This is the definition I found. So, it refers to the systematic collection of patient population electronically stored health information in a digital format. So, absolutely everything we do, basically. Um, they, they come with a great potential, uh, as we saw with the first two talks. Uh, can bring huge benefits to patients, ideally in real time. Can speed up clinical communication, reduce numbers of errors. Uh, and assist doctors uh, if we see them as uh, medical devices. Um, there's an argument that the research and the findings are augmented, augmented with another level of detail. We have lots and lots of data in real life. Uh, but obviously, they come with, with caveats, and I'll cover this later. Um, the UK has a, a unique, uh, a, a number of unique uh, databases in primary care. Uh, researchers from all the, over the world uh, use them. And these are the main players. The Clinical Practice Research Data Link, the Health Improvement Network, or THIN, Q Research, and uh, Research One, which is newly developed. Uh, I had a few slides with more information about them, but in the interest of time, I removed them. So if you're really interested, come and talk to me later to give you some more information. Now, it has 300 to 700 practices covering between 3 to 7% of the UK population. There is great regional variability, as you would expect. For example, Research One has been developed in Yorkshire. Um, and um, there is pay for, for performance driven interoperability. So basically, the NHS uh, gave money to, to general practices to computerize. Uh, this happened in the, in the early 2000s, basically. And there were, there, were, there were interoperability standards put in place uh, for these systems to be compatible with what was the 2004 uh, quality and outcomes framework. Um, so a, a big policy level investment led to the comp complete computerization of UK primary care. So far, so good. The problem is that it, it costs through the incentives and still costing uh, taxpayer around one billion pounds a year, even though it has been reduced over time. Um, 
these databases are complex. They're not data sets, of course. Uh, so they're broken down to numerous tables and there is a large volume. For example, one of the instances we have in Munster uh, with the CPRD is around 300 gigabytes in size. Um, so um, it, it's not something you, you analyze uh, straight out of the box, basically. Uh, I need to highlight that all events, basically, are entered in codes and there are lookup codes available. Um, and we need to be aware that everything that can be recorded will be identified, uh, provided one knows the code and, and what they're looking for, provided the GP actually uses that code in the, their transaction with the patient. So this is what the structure uh, looks like. There are clinical files, referral, immunization, therapy, and test files, and they're relevant lookup files, which we can use to extract data from the event files. And how do we extract the cohort? This is a relatively simple example. Um, so, like I said, we need to use code lists. We, we search for specific search terms or use codes that are used in the incentivization program that I mentioned before. Um, and th these are the, the keywords we can uh, search for. For example, if we're looking for diabetes cases, TIAB, MEL, um, and these are the read codes that are generally associated uh, with, a, with a cough, basically, with the quality and outcomes frameworks, and GPs need to use those to, 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 get, uh, to get money back so that they are routinely used. And we can use uh, these keywords, for example, to search for pro relevant product codes for uh, this group of patients. So how do we extract a code, a, a cohort? Uh, you have to write code, so dedicated software is, uh, is needed, and this is where we come in, basically. Uh, this is what we can bring to the table. Uh, and there is a great need uh, of uh, health informaticians, medical statisticians, like Ian said, to drive this, this field forward. Some examples of what we've done in the past. Now, obviously, I, won't, I will briefly, only briefly touch on randomization. These, these are observational data, and obviously there, there's a big caveat there uh, when you infer uh, effects and causality. Uh, but sometimes randomization is not possible. The, this was the case with this quality and outcomes framework that I mentioned before. It was implemented at the policy, the policy was implemented at the national level, and nobody knew what would happen. So one of the questions, for example, that we had to ask in health services research was what happened to non-incentivized aspects of care over time. Um, so we, we, we extracted data from the database and we used an interrupted time series design to actually see that uh, for some indicators, like measurement indicators, measuring blood pressure, there was a big jump there when the incentive kicked in, but would probably be around here without the incentive by 2006, 2007. So it sped up improvement, but we'd, we'd probably be at the same level uh, within a few years without the incentive. And similarly, we found that there was small deterioration uh, in non-incentivized aspects of care. Even though the cough is big, it doesn't cover absolutely everything. Another example is that this, this data uh, is, um, like I said, big data, lots of uh, patient subgroups. It allows us to go deep into it and uh, look at effects for specific subgroups. So uh, we knew that diabetes care was improving over time, but we didn't know what was happening for specific subgroups, and usually you're underpowered to investigate that. Well, not with these databases, basically. So we saw, for example, that those diagnosed with diabetes, uh, very close to the end of the financial year, they had the, their care deferred to the following year because the GPs could accept them from care because they weren't part, well, these, this was one of the rules of the incentive scheme. So you can see here that there's uh, diverging trends there and after the incentive kick, kicks in, uh, these patients, newly diagnosed diabetes patients, are less well cared for which we, we thought was important finding. Uh, of course, um, some of the tests take time. It might be the case that GPs don't have the time, basically, to do all the tests. And there, there, it's a big domain within this uh, incentivizer 
incentivize, incentivization framework, diabetes covers 17 indicators, so there might be a timing issue there. And the last example, uh, all these are health services uh, research examples that use these databases. Um, is we were interested to see what happens to, to an incentive indicator once it's withdrawn. For example, influenza immunization, uh, uh, which uh, originally covered all these five conditions, uh, asthma, COPD, stroke, uh, coronary heart disease, and diabetes. But the new evidence uh, came out around 2005, and um, the uh, asthma indicator was removed. Um, so we use these databases to, to see basically what happened over time. And what we found, uh, interestingly, was the indicator was still being used by GPs, uh, which from a health services research point of view is important if you want to maximize your money by recycling indicators or even uh, blinding indicators. So th there are a few interesting things that you can do with these databases, especially, like I said, in the absence of uh, clinical trials. So, what are the problems? Um, first, the advantages. Like I said, uh, big data, patient level, uh, and we can do lots of subgroup analysis. They're longitudinal data, um, and it's not available elsewhere. It's available now. We don't have to run a five-year trial at a tremendous cost, uh, obviously, retrospectively, uh, and it's real populations rather than experimental settings. Uh, it's much cheaper than a trial, uh, and ideally, in, in sci-fi future, all these will be integrated in clinical systems and will directly lead to care improvements, again, touching to the, to the previous presentations. What are the big problems? No randomization. I need to say that probably five to ten, to ten times, uh, but obviously this leads to unmeasured confounding. It's a big issue uh, to address that. And uh, lots of work is being done, uh, but we're not quite there yet, and I'm not sure we will ever, we will ever get there. So we're, we're measuring association rather than causation. Uh, and uh, usually it's self-selected units that are contributing data. So the, the general practices have signed up to contributing data to these databases, basically. Uh, the ones that, uh, thank you, the ones that are very poor uh, don't self-select. Um, observational bias, the data quality varies across uh, higher level units uh, and is dependent on external pressures or incentives. For example, the QOF, like I said, there's much work that, that is needed, the complex analysis in there, and it's a record of health services engagement, not necessarily one of health. But I want to, 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 to mention that, for example, the association between tobacco smoking and lung cancer was an observational study. There, there, there have been no trials to date. Uh, the MMR vaccine controversy was this, you know, finalized after uh, observational studies failed to see a link. So it's not all, uh, all bad. Uh, statistical analysis methods, as always, missing data, a big problem, probably bigger than what we, we see in our cities. Uh, ideally, use a multiple imputation framework, not last observational carried forward. Um, mainstream inference is easy once we get this far, so getting the final data set is all 80% of the work, more or less, uh, and we analyze with standard methods. Uh, linear regression, logistic, uh, obviously, there are assumptions, uh, and it's all easy to implement within uh, uh, a multiple imputation framework. And there are more advanced approaches, obviously, uh, and uh, they're being improved all the time. New methods come out. Uh, competing risk regression, spline regression, interrupted time series analysis. And what are the tools? We've developed some tools, and there are some more. Uh, available from elsewhere and more are being developed that can help you if you want to start analyzing these databases. So, um, for example, to, to search uh, relevant codes, uh, representative sampling, data extraction, a really nice package that one of my colleagues uh, drove uh, in R. Power calculations for mixed effects modeling, uh, a really nice algori algorithm, twofold, was developed in UCL. 
for multiple imputation with longitudinal data. Uh, some more specific uh, tools like uh, BMI cleaning, and there is a website we developed here uh, that actually tries to uh, ensure represent to ensure uh, replicability of uh, the analysis by uh, storing uh, codes that are, were used in the analysis. And uh, I'll finish off with this, uh, with reporting guidelines that, was on, that were only published last year, uh, uh, following, following on uh, the, the strobe guidelines, uh, taking into account the unique features of these, uh, of these analysis. So, uh, what to take home? Uh, like I said, uh, complexity. I mean, you know that, you're not clinicians, so it's not like pressing a button. Uh, there's a measure of confounding and other biases, very difficult to take into account and control for and adjust for. Uh, most of the work is not really statistical. It's more health informatics related. Um, analysis options have similarities, but are much more challenging than in RCTs, especially old school RCTs with 50 patients in its arm, two arms. Uh, confidentiality is a big issue. A uh, big deal, uh, the uh, care dot data fiasco, if you're aware of that, if not, look it up. Um, and quality varies quite a lot uh, between and within databases. And in database of this size, p-values are irrelevant. I mean, we generally uh, accept that p-values are irrelevant uh, as statisticians, but uh, especially in these databases, uh, it's even worse. Thank you. So you very, very briefly touched on reproducibility, and I guess that's um, the kit. You've got so many degrees of freedom in conducting these analyses in terms of uh, selecting your code lists, choosing which analyses to run, which imputation methods to use. How do you protect against that in these kind of analyses to ensure that the reproducibility is as high as possible? Well, as always, it's down to the authors, but uh, in my view, the journals need to do a better job uh, in adjusting in these changing environments where the method section is not two paragraphs basically. Uh, the BMJ has done a good job uh, in increasing its limit. And actually, there, there isn't a limit. But if you say try to submit to The Lancet or another big traditional clinical journal with a 3,000 word or 2,700 word limit, it's impossible basically without a massive appendix. Um, like I say, um, the record statement tries to touch on that. Uh, by bringing these issues to the attention of, of the journals, which need to accept that and embrace that statement. Uh, but it, it's always done to us, and, and the review process, I guess. Uh, so we, we, we need to improve. Yeah. You mentioned um, the care dot data fiasco, which um, I would love to try to solve, <laughs> which I can't solve by myself. But we had a big discussion at the Society of Social Medicine, actually, I think two years ago, and it might have been last year in Oxford, to do with getting together data sets where we could really show the public what had really been gained by linking data together, exactly like the primary care data you're talking about, and other longitudinal studies, and getting epidemiologists together to just do probably a television programme actually on Channel 4 to try and sell the case for, well perhaps it shouldn't be called cares or data anymore, but how, why linking together data really is to the advantage of patients in this country and also that epidemiologists linking data effectively have to sign the Official Secrets Act to keep confidentiality. I mean it is, you know, you lose your job if you really don't, but they don't understand that either. And so there's a whole communication challenge that I wondered whether you'd like to be involved in and perhaps Ian Buckham could be involved as well and a few other people because actually that is begged by Ian's talk as well actually that uh, we can't just presume that in this country but we can try to win the public over by education which is not an easy thing but um, I, I was just going to ask you if you've thought about perhaps completely agree and we think about example. it discuss it all the time and that's where Ian's coming from uh, yeah, with the yeah. data saves life. The problem is we're preaching to the converted all the time. 
that probably in this audience you are but it's, um, but it's actually, very difficult to engage like 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 you say it's an educational barrier there it's uh, sort of winning the journalists as well and yes, and, and winning and, the case uh, within our country to, to, to make the case. And the media, let's say the media, are, are not helping. I mean, typical, typically the tabloids uh, and their targeted population, they, they, they're not interested in public benefit, really, are they? They're interested well, in... some of them are, but you have to find the good journalists. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean... It's a big challenge. I mean, we, we have done that in the past through the Health and Social Science and Information Centre in Leeds, try to promote uh, what can be done with their data uh, and it is a barrier and the, the average um, uh, taxpayer doesn't know where the money is going, what's being used for and how that can be used to improve services or drive policy. Um, how to change that? <laughs> I'm all ears. I'm, I'm not sure it's really to do with money, it's more to do with um, understanding confidentiality and using experts who have... There's an ownership uh, issue there as well in terms of, of their data uh, in relation to, to the NHS and what it does with I agree. it. Uh, it is their data really, the patient's data. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's winning, it's, it is winning minds and winning understanding of epidemiology. Really. Just, just one quick one quick comment. Um, Margaret, please look at Twitter hashtag data saves lives. I think the one lesson for the research community in all of our work uh, with public involvement, which has been quite deep, is to know when to let go. When to let go of a research question that isn't being answered because of cultural, often not practical or technical barriers to linking sharing data but simply cultural and organisational barriers. When you give that problem to members of the public, it's a much more powerful voice than us saying, please break those barriers down. Okay, and on that note, can we thank Evan again for stimulating that interesting discussion? What I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to set the scene and then uh, introduce a couple of examples uh, to uh, illustrate the principles. So I'm going to be working within a, a statistical modeling framework. Um, uh, I'm going to be wanting to um, infer from data. Uh, I'm wanting to explain underlying mechanisms. Um, and I've, I've provided some quotes from uh, the uh, JRSS um, editorial by David Hand on big data. There's no escape from big data. Um, and then we're wanting to uh, use statistical models to understand um, some underlying mechanism um, to allow us to um, answer theory-driven research questions. So, working within a statistical modelling framework, more specifically, we're going to be using the family of generalised linear models. Hopefully, they'll be familiar to uh, most of you. And I'll define um, the Poisson model that I shall be using shortly in the context of the two examples. Um, but just a, a slide on what we mean by statistical misinformation. Uh, well, that first bullet point is actually the title of a recent paper. What do we mean by misapplication of statistical methods? Well, uh, uh, we can introduce bias into the inferential process, uh, and by doing so, you know, that can lead to misleading results and or conclusions. And as we heard from the excellent plenary talk earlier on, um, there can be many potential sources of bias. And here I'm going to focus on just a small number of different sources. And again, we've already heard about uh, sample selection bias, 
so I'm not going to dwell on that here. A um, couple of other sources of bias I want to focus in on here. Um, bias, if we ignore the endogeneity of regressors, and the omitted variable bias if we ignore heterogeneity due to the presence of omitted effects. And I say we're going to work within a generalized linear modeling framework. Um, so all of that should be familiar to you. So to the standard generalized linear model, we're going to add a random effect, which we're going to denote by U, to represent the heterogeneity uh, due to emitted effects. So this U, this random effect U, will vary from one individual to another. Uh, if we look at studies of the elderly, then we rec could regard these random effects U as frailty, uh, known in more general terms as heterogeneity. All right? That if we ignore the emitted variables through the random effects, then that introduces bias into our inferential procedure. And in particular, I've highlighted baseline measures. Um, I do a lot of uh, uh, reviewing of um, applied papers and the number of times authors include baseline measures in models for second and subsequent responses, well, that was problematic because baseline values by their very nature are endogenous to those second and subsequent responses. Um, so um, what we need to do is um, take endogeneity into account um, as well as heterogeneity. So what is endogeneity? Well, I provided a formal definition there and a couple of um, general examples. Right. But I'll illustrate these principles uh, with a particular example um, where we've got three uh, responses to be count variables, numbers of visits to the doctor, number of prescription drugs, and number of non-prescription drugs taken. And this is from the Australian Health Survey from uh, Cameron and Trevady. So there we've got uh, there are three response variables. D visits, prescript, non-prescript. Right, well, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce three random effects, one for each of our three counts, denoted by UD, UP, and UN. And we're going to allow those three random effects to be correlated with each other. Right, move on. Um, right, so why use a joint model? Right, well, by allowing these three random effects to be correlated with each other, we're able to account for the correlation between our three count variables, as well as accounting for heterogeneity due to emitted effects. And what we're also going to do is, we're going to include, as a regressor in the model for the number of non-prescribed drugs, we're going to include the number of prescribed drugs as well, and we'll see what happens. Um, as well as um, prescribed drugs um, in the model for non-prescribed drugs, we've also got a set of um, primary explanatory variables. Um, describing the health insurance status of the individuals, as well as a set of secondary explanatory variables, demographics, and some indicators of the general state of the individual's health, as well as income. 
Right, so let's define formally this trivariate Poisson model. So for each measure, we've got our linear predictor and a random effect, plus for our model for the number of non-prescribed drugs, we've also got an additional term to take into account the effect of the number of prescribed drugs. So what do we want to do? We want to estimate the regression coefficients, beta and delta, and the elements of the variance, covariance matrix. Right, so let's have a look. We've got a summary of some results there. Fine, but I want to move on and see what the effect of number of prescribed drugs on the model for number of non-prescribed drugs has as we increase the complexity of our model. Well, we start off with a standard Poisson model without any random effects. We then introduce a random effect, a separate random effect for each of the three counts. And then we allow the three random effects to be correlated with each other. Uh, so we see what happens to the uh, level of significance for number of prescribed drugs. Remember, this is in the model for number of non-prescribed drugs. We see that the significance of number of prescribed drugs drops, indicating that number of prescribed drugs is indeed endogenous, whereas the level of significance for illness um, remains fairly stable, despite it adding random effects to the, the modeling framework. So I've said all that. Um, we can also, oh dear, we've got a slide here right there. Um, uh, we can have a look at the effect of including number of prescribed drugs as a regressor in the model for number of prescribed drugs, uh, what effect it has on the variance covariance matrix. And we can see, as was mentioned earlier on, as soon as we take into account, or as soon as we include number of prescribed drugs, an endogenous variable, we can see that that has a, a dramatic effect on covariances involving the random effect for number of non-prescribed drugs and the other two random effects. Um, the impact's not so great um, if we add uh, illness to the model for non-prescribed, so I haven't provided the results for the variance covariance matrix in that case. Right, so having this ability to take into account correlated random effects has allowed us to check for the endogeneity of illness um, in the model for number of prescribed drugs. Um, but that data set's quite limited in scope, it's only cross-sectional. So in the last couple of minutes, I'll move on to um, uh, thinking about longitudinal data. Because again, as we've already heard, longitudinal data presented with all sorts of analytical challenges, which I have not got time to dwell on here. Uh, but I must just mention uh, a second example. So this is some data that I've been working with since I yet started down in Swansea. Uh, so this is a, um, an intervention study. Uh, we're looking at the, the impact of um, interventions to properties. And we're looking at the impact of that intervention, or those interventions, which comprise a number of elements on these three primary outcomes, numbers, hospital admissions for various conditions. Um, and there we are, we've got a whole range of elements making up the intervention. 
a primary explanatory variable we want to take into account whilst adjusting for likes of gender, age, and comorbidities. Right, well, what we've been doing thus far is we've been looking at each of the three outcomes separately, uh, and we've been applying mixed Poisson models. Um, but, uh, of course, we can imagine that these three outcomes are correlated with each other. So what we'd like to uh, look at it in the future is we look at the correlation between those three outcomes uh, by fitting a, a mixed trivariate Poisson model. Um, a slight complication with that is uh, we happen to have small numbers of injuries, that's falls and burns. So we think we might have to dichotomize numbers of uh, injuries into zero injuries and one or more. So then that would lead us to uh, want to fit a mixed Poisson, Poisson binary model. Uh, so again, as the previous speaker, here I've just provided a, a short list, by no means an exhaustive list of some of the bits of software out there um, that you can use uh, to fit multivariate mixed models, commercial software, um, as well as open source uh, code such as R. Um, myself and my former colleagues at Lancaster um, did write some uh, specialist software called Sabre, which unfortunately doesn't work with the current release of R, um, but we are um, rewriting that uh, as a new bit of software. Um, right, so some concluding remarks there, and I shall finish um, the final word of optimism and caution uh, from uh, David Hand. Uh, so, uh, Right, so uh, I'll finish there. Right, thank you. Right.